It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 255 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 19th of February, 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. Uh, before we start, I want to say a quick thank you to Brett Henry and Pete Ellinger for being our first patrons. Brett and Pete both signed up with Patreon and pledged to donate a few dollars to help us out with the show. Uh, we're very grateful for that. If you want to join their esteemed company, head to scienceontop.com slash donate and once signed up, you can select what level you want to pledge and what reward you'd like. And you get to help us out, cover the costs of running the show. And on this show, we'll be talking about smelly armpits, smelly malaria, and whether or not Earth just got an eighth continent. Because, Penny, I've seen a lot of headlines along the lines of scientists have discovered a new continent. Yeah, and let me tell you. I could not click on those headlines fast enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> the idea that suddenly we found a continent just lying there. Oh, my God. No one ever saw yeah, it before. Sure. It was there all along. I'm waiting oh. for the volcanic apocalypse to start. And <laughs> but, okay, so this is it's not really a new discovery, is it? No. At, well, no. Atlantis has not sort of risen <laughs> around New Zealand or anything. It's more a definitional thing and... Something I found quite interesting is that there is no sort of governing body that decides what is and what is not a continent. It's done by consensus within the, the scientific community. So what is a continent? And it's kind of interesting because this continent, Zealandia, is um, bounded around New Zealand, but about 94% of it is underneath the water. So New Zealand is there up on top, you know, I think everyone's familiar with where it is next to Australia. And then this continent, if you look at a sort of a seafloor map, you can see that there's a big, wide, shallow area around it. And it's comparable in size to the Indian continent. So I think that's kind of interesting because I think most people, when they hear new continent, think new landmass mm. above the ocean. But a I continent admit, is actually... that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, no. That's and exactly that's... what I thought. That's why I was like clicking like a nutcase on <laughs> to see what on earth had happened to poor old New Zealand. But um, it's, <laughs> I should have really thought back to, you know, my studies and going, well, yeah. a continent is, continental shelf is not actually, it doesn't matter if it's above the water or below the water. It's a different kind of crust to ocean crust. So on the earth, there's two kinds of crust. There's oceanic crust, which is very, sort of heavy, really basaltic, lots of um, heavy minerals in it, and that wells up from the mid-ocean ridge system and is quite, I don't know, dark and black. And there's the continental crust, which is formed through volcanism. And it's a lot lighter because it's the lighter fractions of the rocks that melt that come up. And if you look at one of those recreations of, you know, the history of the earth, and you look at the sea level going up and down, you can see sometimes there is almost no land on Earth at all, like around, you know, a few hundred million years ago because sea levels were so high and sea levels drop. And we even know, we know, for example, that the Australia used to be connected, um, the main continent of Australia used to be connected to Tasmania by a land bridge. So even the Australian continent changes shape depending on where sea levels is. So sea level is actually kind of irrelevant for continent. It's looking at the kinds of rock and the kinds of features that make it a continent. So this new sort of, the reason it's in the news at the moment is because there's been a new paper published which is sort of weighing in on 20 years worth of data and debate. It's not, cre no, there's no more, there's no new data, just like there's no new land, but it's real <laughs> synthesising it all and putting an argument that, yeah, we should consider this a continent. Oh, sorry, I was just saying, it's yeah. essentially a review article. They've got yeah, it's together. a review article. Yeah. But with a sort of a, an agenda of the, if other things this size are considered continents, I mean, this probably should be too. And it is sort of a relevant thing. I mean, even the idea of plate tectonics kind of originated from an idea of continental drift, which originated from the idea that if you have a look at Africa and South America, they kind of fit together. 
and they don't fit together perfectly. But if you look at the boundary of their continental crust under the ocean, they pretty much do. So this consideration of like which crust belongs to a continent is probably worth doing. It can help us understand um, what's been happening with plate tectonics a bit more. But I sort of think uh, one of the authors was like, oh, let's hope this makes it into popular culture. And I just think it never will. No. Because it's underwater. <laughs> and also yeah. Zealandia. I mean, I'm, I always almost say Zoolander every time I have to mention it anyway. <laughs> so I don't think it's going to catch on just because it's not a very catchy name. I'm curious, though, about how they define the borders of it, though. Is it just, is it where the crust becomes a different type of crust? It becomes sea crust and not volcanic crust? Or is it, is there like, there's no tectonic uh, rim or anything? There's no plate boundary, is there? No, there's no like plate boundaries around it. Um, the arguments for where it sort of starts and ends, I think, are a bit technical. I couldn't really follow okay. In completely, but it, it is different borders and faults and different kinds of crust. So it's it's not a simple um, thing like a plate boundary where there'll be you can say there's faulting and volcanoes and stuff like that. It's mm. more a question of degree. Right. Maybe New Zealand could do some sort of a referendum. Do you want to remain as part of the oceanic crust, or do you want to leave and form your own Zealand <laughs> continent, <laughs> or not? Uh, I mean, so, so isn't isn't New Zealand on a bit like Japan? Doesn't yeah. it sit on the border of a continental crust anyway? Or well, it's on a it's on a fault. It's on a uh, a, fo uh, um, a plate border, but yeah. continents and plates don't. Oh, they're different. So, yeah, for example, course. if you think about India and um, Asia, the continents, there's a plate boundary there where the mm. Himalayas are, but um, no ocean. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Of course. Yeah. All right. Well, it's it's interesting that these scientific debates happen anyway, and it's good that at least some geology is getting into the mainstream news because I'm sure a lot of people are now thinking about plate tectonics that wouldn't have otherwise been. So that's good. But shall we move on to the stinky armpit story? And Shane, we've talked extensively <laughs> on this show about the gut microbiome, the trillions of bacteria that live in our guts and help us process food. But just for a change today, let's talk about the skin microbiome. Mm. This is the bacteria that lives on and in our skin. How can a bacteria transplant help people with bad body odour? Asking for a friend. Yeah, well, this is actually quite interesting. I have not much give, given this much thought, to be perfectly honest. Um, but it's been noted that certain people's body odour is quite intolerable and others is, you know, not so bad. What this study was looking for... Looking at it, started off with a study in twins, where you know identical twins who one of their body odors was pretty bad, and the other ones was okay. And this um, researcher sort of hypothesized, well, maybe it's the, or you know, it must be, it probably is the skin, the bacteria that are living under the armpit of the different twins. So this is, uh, and this is, this makes sense because um, the smell, the odor that's emitted is basically bacteria metabolizing and giving off all their waste products and things. Apparently, m m uh, microbes that feed on lipids, so, you know, fats and oils and that sort of stuff, that can give off an, off an especially bad body odour. So, if you have very lipid, you know, very sort of oily skin naturally, you are likely to have quite bad BO or you could have bad BO because of the bacteria that live on your skin and eat it. Um, it all, apparently, also, this can also tire the diet as well. So, if you avoid fatty foods, you might improve your body odour. But that's all sort of a long-term view this is this is an actual sort of a <laughs> they wanted to see if they could actually replace a person's armpit microbiome so they got these two twins they said to the twin that didn't smell okay don't wash we want you to grow bacteria and the reason for that is because the bacteria that live on and in your skin they get shed off it's, it, that, it, it is just a matter of sort of you know taking a swab and there's heaps of bacteria there you, you need to you, you, they need a time to travel up from the skin cells mm -hmm. okay and the second the twin that did smell, they said, okay, basically wash yourself with antibacterial soap, get rid of all your armpit microbiome. And then, yeah, they basically did a, a, micro, a, a, a bacterial transplant and transplanted the, the non-smelly twin's bacteria from his armpit to the smelly twin's armpit. <laughs> and so basically, 
the 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 donee who received his brother's bacterial um yeah his his, his brother's transplant. armpit bacteria um yeah he's apparently his body odor problem dissipated quite rapidly too um, and has and been gone for over a year for a year now I don't know if that's with repeated treatments or if that's just as a one off because in, in the article um, it's implied it was just the one off but yeah. But then they do say something like, you know, for a month or two at least. So, I'm guessing this further study they did, they repeated this mm-hmm. procedure with 17 other pairs of people, um, presumably one smelly, one not. Apparently, they're all quite closely related, which is, I suppose, important. And yeah, they saw, I think it was, what was the, what was the, yeah, of the 18 pairs, so including the original pair, obviously, 16 saw improvements. So, I don't know what happened to the outlier, but I guess, yeah. Yes, here we go. And half the group had long-term effects that last three months or more. So, yeah. That's an awkward conversation, though. You know, brother, yeah, I've got this problem where I've got really bad body odor. Would you mind doing a transplant of some of your bacteria in your armpit? Yeah. (laughs) It's just a very (laughs) odd dinner table conversation, I think. Well, I mean... Look, uh, uh, and look, on a serious note, apparently this could then extend to other skin conditions, some you mm-hmm. know more serious ones like eczema or psoriasis or et cetera. So, you know, it, it's it's a sound kind of proof of principle study, I think. <laughs> no, small it, sample size, cool. but, you know, it's... Yeah. But also I can see this as being... Like they're talking about in future they're going to try and cultivate a particular set of bacteria recipe that you could sort of apply if you have it. You don't need to have that awkward dinner conversation with a relative. You can just apply that. And, of course, from then I can imagine it being, you know, you have probiotic deodorants and things because, of course, people are going to try and make money off it. But if it works and if it makes the world a less stinky place, I'm all for (laughs) it. Yeah. All right. Well, while we're talking about body odour then, do you want to tell us about uh, the malaria parasite and why it's, it makes its host smell good to mosquitoes, basically? Yeah, um, so this is actually a bit more of a serious story. Uh, and, it's, it, and it's all, it's, again, very early days because the way, they, the way they determined this may not account for a lot of different natural variables. So basically, we all know what malaria is. We all know that um, it's probably one of them probably one of the most devastating diseases that I can think of currently that's rampaging through the world, even though there are good ways of controlling it, but it's just, it's, it's extremely adaptable. Um, the malaria parasite is very, very, very good at uh, adapting to changing circumstances. And so apparently are their hosts, which will, come, which will become more apparent at the very end of this article. So basically in the bloodstream, malaria parasites will uh, release a substance that somehow it, it it basically makes its mosquito vectors much more likely to bite bite that infected person and then spread the spread the, spread the parasite, which makes sense. Obviously, you want to get to new hosts before you before your old host dies out. So, what these researchers did to prove this essentially was they got they they they, they, they had two vials of blood, one that was mixed with malaria malaria parasite or just regular blood, and they had a Y shaped tube. Now they haven't got a picture of this, but I'm guessing that it was. You know, like a little glass tube that split off into a um, a fork, mm-hmm. and they essentially released all these mosquitoes down, and ninety five percent of the mosquitoes went straight for the blood with the malaria substance, with, with you know with with malaria parasites. Huh. So, yeah, it's it's pretty clear that okay, something is attracting these mosquitoes to that parasite. So, it's an important discovery in terms of how they behave. The question is that some have some have said, well, okay. This is not obviously a real-life scenario. You don't have pools of blood with malaria parasite floating around. Um, there are different <laughs> factors that, are, <laughs> that, that there are different factors that will contribute to this, like you know the temperature of the you know the, te- the temperature of the place, you know, all, all who, you know who it bites. It's just it, it's again proof of principle, but it's a nice little start to prove that this is the case. Is there anything that we can do with that? Is it possible that we can? Make a chemical that blocks it or reduces its effectiveness. I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, you, yeah, you, that would be the idea, right? To really to to develop something that will stop this. I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure if they know what it is that is produced, what, what pheromone is produced by the parasite. Right. Um, yeah, it's also weird. I mean, so they they did the test in blood, 
But we don't know how that necessarily affects... Like, are they sweating that chemical out or something? How does that yeah, get I'm, to the outside I'm, environment? I'm really not sure, to be honest. That's, that's a very good question. Um, yeah. As you say, it's yeah, a think- preliminary study, but yeah. All right, Lucas. A team of astrophysicists from the University of Toronto have managed to calculate the speed at which the sun orbits the Milky Way. And from this, they were able to obtain, and this is a uh, quote from Universe Today, a precise distance estimate between our sun and the centre of the galaxy. <laughs> it's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly sort of this. <laughs> so this is using data from the Gaia Space Observatory. Yeah, Gaia. Yeah, yeah. Gaia <laughs> is uh, is a pretty cool mission, actually. Um, uh, Gaia is the the um, ESA, uh, the, the European Space Agency mission to um, basically map the Milky Way in 3D, which is really cool. And I've seen some animations based on some of the Gaia data, you know, where you can basically fly around the universe and see the constellations you all know and love um, sort of up close and personal. And you can fly between them, which is which is kind of cool. But this study is actually building on a study previously done by the one of the or I think a couple of the, the authors of this study. Study where they when they were elsewhere, and it, it links back to I think it was around 2000 that they um, or the, the data was from 2000 that they originally based their study on, and this is uh, Jason Hunt and his uh, co-authors um, uh, who are now at the University of Toronto. But basically, they they've now added to this uh, this previous estimate. So previously. We were looking at uh, a distance of anything between 7.6 to 8.2 kiloparsecs, which works out to around, give or take, around 25,000 light years. So it's 24,788 to 26,745 light years. Meh! You know, it's, uh, you know, what's a few, what's a few thousand light years between friends? <clears throat> so it's, uh, you know, when you're dealing with these sort of distances, pfft, <laughs> Who cares? Uh, <laughs> but obviously, you know, it's 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 um, it's really difficult to figure this out because there's a lot of things that kind of uh, affect our ability to to map this. Um, you, basically, you know, one of the, the chief things is 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 how do we measure the distance between us and the centre of the Milky Way when we can't directly see it? Mm-hmm. We've got a lot of stuff between us and it, and we're dealing with apparent relative uh, velocities here because it's all moving. So you know, there's it's it's pretty difficult to figure this out. So you know, bring in data from 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 Gaia, the Gaia mission, which is basically its its bread and butter is measuring distances through orbital velocities and giving us that sort of information so we can build this 3D map. And having much more accurate data, and we're talking, you know, a staggering amount of stars here. I mean, what went into this particular study was it was over 200,000 of the study of the stars went into the study from 500,000 stars, which had radio velocity and spectra, which came from the Gaia mission. Now Gaia has now up to the billions of stars uh, in its mapping. Now it's it's I was just checking the the Gaia mission before, so you know it's it's a staggering amount of, of data that's in there. But this is based on that initial data set. Of the 500,000 and and um, 200,000 of which were, were observed from Gaia and another uh, study which came out of the Australian Astronomical Observatory. So you know there's two data sets involved here and uh, they've cross-referenced these and and basically from that they're able to to figure out. We know the relative velocities of these stars around us. We were able to cross-reference that with stars that appear to have practically no relative velocity, which means they're either you know traveling at the same rate as, as us or they don't appear, appear to have angular momentum and math, 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 math basically gets involved. And, and from all this, they can, uh, they can hone down on that study. So now they reckon that the, uh, the distance is around 7.6 um, Oh, sorry. I think I gave the the previous uh, the first distance uh, uh, wrong. I gave the current distance. So uh, yeah, so it was 7.2 to 8.8, which is 23,000 to 28,000 light years. Now it's as I mentioned before, which is uh, 7.6 to 8.2 kiloparsecs, which is this 24,000 to 26,000. So the error bars have come in. Okay. So it is a more precise estimate. Um, so I can kind of see where they were going uh, with with the wording of that story. The the estimate has been honed down, and there's smaller error 
Terra bars. But something that's really staggering from this, um, other than the, the distance itself, and this, of course, is, is measuring the distance to uh, Sagittarius A, which is the supermassive black hole believed to be at the center of our, of our galaxy, is, is the speed of moving. Now, wrap your heads around this. So our sun is moving around the center of the Milky Way at a speed of roughly... 240 kilometers per second, which is 864,000 kilometers an hour. And this is just 240k a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we don't Absolutely. we don't fall off. What is going on? We don't fall off. I know, <laughs> man. <laughs> that's that's so, pretty impressive though. Every second to travel 240 kilometers. But, you know, it's in space, which is pretty big. But there was there was also um some, 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 you know, for me, it seemed like a byproduct based, you know, from, from, uh, from the study, but, but, uh, um, finding stars that, that had previously had very close to zero angular momentum. And what that means in an orbit is it just falls inwards. Um, you know, it's, it's the fact that things are going around the Earth, for example, that keeps them in orbit. If they were just standing still, uh, and not moving at all, they would basically just fall straight down. So, um, there are stars that, 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 basically you know had uh, very low angular momentum which meant that they they do just fall in towards the center of the galaxy and if they're not lined up perfectly and generally nothing would be because you know it's not like things just fall straight into an event horizon they always end up in a sort of a an orbit around it as they get shredded hmm. Um, but these things, these stars, things, <laughs> tiny things, these stars would, would basically approach the, the center of the Milky Way. They'd accelerate, accelerate, accelerate as they got in there. And then they would just zip around. Think of a comet going around our sun, similar sort of thing. And then what happens is they end up just completely off the plane of the Milky Way. So, you know, you think of the spiral arms of the Milky Way. Um, these things, rather than being in those beautiful spiral arms, just get chucked out at all sorts of weird, you know, weird orbits. So, um, yeah, also cool, you know. I was thinking about that the, these are whole stars and probably all the planets <laughs> that they're pulling along with them that are on these absurd, you know, zipping uh, sort of orbits. It's uh, really cool. That is cool. So they're, they're going to do follow-ups. There'll be more follow-ups of these. So there's a, there's a huge um, uh, release of data uh, from Gaia, which uh, this story said uh, late 2017, but the Gaia website is saying this is now scheduled for April 2018. So um, one assumes they'll be updating this even more because they'll have a bigger data set. But either way, how cool. Really, really cool. All right, Penny. We know that bats, dolphins, whales, and a bunch of other animals use echolocation to compensate for their poor eyesight. But now a team at Russian Academy of Sciences have shown that the Vietnamese pygmy dormouse may also see with ultrasound. So this is the first uh, land-dwelling mammal, I guess, isn't it, that uses echolocation? Not land-dwelling, but well, the, the, tree the, the tree climbing yeah, mammal. So in some ways it's like... Mm another one but it, it is quite interesting it's not completely confirmed that it uses echolocation it's more of a um like a preliminary study so they they've tested the mice they do produce these um ultrasonic sort of pulses which are like um echolocation calls but what they haven't done is tested them in the dark so it might be that they're supplementing poor vision with echo location, mm -hmm. but it's not completely shown that, that they can hear the echo, where it's producing it from, and if they actually test if the call rate changes when they approach an, an obstacle. So it's more like, oh, hey, this animal might be doing it. Here's what we know now. But what is interesting, I thought, is in some ways it's like, oh, yeah, whatever, like, because a lot, a, a quite a few other mammals do it. So obviously there's the, the ocean mammals, bat, um, dolphins and whales, but also bats, so flying ones are known to echolocate, and also apparently uh, rats and shrews use it. But most mammals have quite good vision, so they don't really need to. Mm -hmm. But what I did think was interesting is it's it could be an indication, or not an indication, but a bit of a clue as to what came first, because I think when I think of echolocation, the first um, animals I think of are bats, yep. which use it flying. So is it something that evolved because of flying? To you know, And I've seen video of um, a bat, you know, honing in on a moth mm. from metres away. Or is it something that was already there and adapted really well when bats started to fly so if um dormice have evolved this ability for purely non-flying reasons i guess like to navigate through trees and maybe you know see there's a branch coming up or mm. something that could be an interesting indication in how it might have evolved in bats 
Yeah. We also, we don't know if this is a hunting thing or just a navigation thing. Is it just to yeah, crawl yeah. around the tree or is it to go, mm. well, there's food over there. I must go and eat it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I did get the impression it was quite, um, quite preliminary. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's very cool. Uh, it's, it's it always cool. amazes me the various different ways that different animals use to navigate around the environment. I think my favourite favourite is the the scorpions. That you know they, they reckon they maybe they use infrared mm. infrared light from stars. Okay. Yes, <laughs> and same with the dung beetle as well. It can yeah. use the Milky Way to guide themselves. It's like the, the last thing you would think of <laughs> as ways of navigation. Yeah. yeah. All right, I think we're done. If you want any more information about the stories we talked about or you want to get in touch, check out scienceontop.com slash 255 and there you'll find our social media information and you can leave a comment or you can leave us a review on iTunes. And don't forget scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help us out financially. Thanks for joining me today, Shane, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. No worries. Thanks, Ed. This episode was edited with Wicked Mad Skills by Marcos Benamou. <coughs> And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week with a live show from Surf Coast Skeptic Camp at Aries Inlet. Join us then. The revelation of the new continent is something pretty exciting. I mean, continents are the world's largest solid objects. And, and here we have another one. Fingers are now crossed. Zealandia will become widely known as a major continent. What we hope will happen is that Zealandia will appear on world maps. In, in schools, everywhere. Science classes set to get even more interesting. It's just cool, isn't it, to actually have our own continent. Zealandia, home of New Zealand. Wilhine, One News.